science knowledge only adds to the excitement and mystery and the awe of a flower. Evidence is evidence. It's public. Everybody can look at the evidence and assess it and eventually, if there's enough evidence, come to the same conclusion. Cockatoos with attitude. Cockatoos. So we'll talk a little bit about infectious diseases. Um, there, the incidence of infectious disease um, in parrots really disappeared with the end of importation. So when I started as a exotic animal, avian veterinarian in the early 1980s, um, prob we probably saw more infectious disease than anything else, second only to maybe um, nutritional problems. Uh, today, infectious disease is a very small percentage of the diseases that we see, and we see primarily nutritional and husbandry problems, and, um, and then just metabolic things, old age, arthritis, a lot of things that are related to um, the paradigm of bird ownership, which we can talk about in another video. Good idea. Um, so the the common infectious diseases in parrots, um, perhaps the most notorious is psittacosis. That's the uh, chlamydial disease that causes the disease that's called parrot fever in people. Um, once um, very common, I would say that we'd see 40, 50 cases a year. Now we're, we probably only see four or five cases a year. So down by a factor of 10. Um, polyomavirus a disease that had a huge um, explosion in the late 1980s, um, caused significant um, damage to the um, bird breeding um, industry and, and, um, and the pet bird trade, the pet shops and bird shops, because polyoma would go through and kill every baby bird in a pet shop. Um, uh, Pacheco's virus, which is a herpes viral hepatitis of, of birds, which um, um, some birds are chronic carriers, just like herpes viruses in lots of uh, species, um, including people, but can cause very acute disease. So a bird can be exposed to a bird who's a chronic carrier, get sick and die in less than a week. Um, uh, Cloacal papilloma disease, which is another herpes virus disease that causes a warty-like growth in the cloaca of birds. Still a big problem in especially um, South American birds, Amazons and, um, and macaws, and um, can lead to um, um, other diseases like bile duct carcinoma or, um, or pancreatic carcinoma. Um, West Nile virus, which only recently came to the United States. I don't know the exact year off the top of my head, but is spread by biting insects. Um, we do see some of the viral encephalidides. Those are primarily horse and bird, wild bird diseases, but if they get into parrots, um, can kill your parrots. Um, proventricular dilatation disease, or what today is being called um, avian bornaviral disease, um, which we found in the early 1980s. And, um, but only found the virus that caused it in the last four or five years. And um, which one am I missing? Um, uh, beak and feather? Beak and feather disease. Beak and feather disease, which is caused by the circle virus, another disease that um, um, really devastated the bird trade for years and years. Um, took us a long, long time to find the virus, and, um, and now is um, is rare because we've done such a good job testing for it. We hope you will consider supporting us on Patreon today. This is how it works. We produce up to two videos a month. As a patron, you pledge to give us a donation, whatever you feel is right and meets your budget. And Patreon gives us your gift monthly. You can easily set a limit on how much you donate a month. You can change the amount of your pledge at any time. 
your gift will allow us to continue bringing you entertaining and informative videos. Some of our planned videos are home exams, how to do a home exam quickly, efficiently, and properly. Early detection saves lives. A new paradigm, what it means to be a parrot owner. An interview with Dr. Jeffrey Jenkins of the Avian and Exotic Animal Hospital. Who is training whom? Behavior training and how to empower your bird to make good choices in our world. As a patron, you can also choose to be in the Producer's Circle, the Director's Circle, or the Advisor's Circle. Each donation level has benefits. You can find out about these on our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Chloe Sanctuary. We look forward to your participation in Cockatude. So let's go over those quick. Um, probably the most important one is still psittacosis. Um, psittacosis is a disease of parrots that's caused by chlamydia. Um, this, the trick of chlamydia, which is a parasitic bacteria. So it's a bacteria that can't grow on the countertop. It can't grow on your skin. It has to grow inside a cell and um, in order to replicate itself. Um, chlamydia, like any good parasite, does its best not to kill its host. It wants to drag that out. So lots of different species of animals have chlamydial diseases. As humans, we have two. We have a venereal chlamydial disease that causes damage to our reproductive tract, and we have a respiratory chlamydia that, live, that at least initially causes respiratory disease, causes uh, damage to the respiratory disease, our respiratory system, and then hides in other tissues. And uh, just as a little side, may turn out to be a major player in atherosclerosis, heart disease, and strokes in people. Um, and it may turn out that your lifestyle is only part of that disease, and the other part is having had the chlamydial disease for the for most of your life. So it's an interesting disease. Um, the parrot's chlamydia is most often transmitted vertically. It comes from the parents, goes to the chicks. Um, it may be uh, that they're born with it. It may be that they they get it from their mom while their mom's um, feeding them. Um, it um, is a systemic disease, but it likes to live in their liver tissue. So this organism gets in there and um, replicates um, if in acute infection. So um, if a bird gets it and it's never had it before, sometimes they will actually get sick. Um, just like if you catch the venereal chlamydial disease of people, you have a, after you get it, you have a period of time where you might have symptoms of that disease, but then those symptoms go away. So if the parrot survives the initial disease, um, then that, um, organism becomes kind of in, gets into its routine and it lives in its liver and over a long period of time, anywhere from five to 20 years, um, it destroys that bird's liver. And intermittently as that bird go, as that organism goes through its um, life cycle, um, that organism's um, shed into the bird's feces. And so other birds get it from being exposed to the droppings either fresh or even dried of other birds who have the disease and people who catch it, the same thing. Um, uh, there are different strains of chlamydia and we found <clears throat> over the years that um, um, when a parent gets a different species chlamydia, sometimes it's the disease is much worse. So if a parent gets the chicken strains of chlamydia or some other things, then they're probably more likely to actually get sick and die from them than if they get the diseases that have become habituated in parrot species. So if they get the disease from their mom, they're probably not as likely to have overt clinical signs. Well, what are those signs? Well, if your bird gets chlamydia, um, he may have no signs at all. He may look perfectly normal, and that's one of the reasons why we go looking for that in birds who are going to you know, um, come to a boarding facility or go to a new home. It's commonly one of the tests that avian veterinarians do when you adopt a new bird or buy it, purchase a new bird. Um, part of the reason that we check for it, quite honestly, is also liability. Um, because if we don't check your bird and then you catch 
psittacosis from the bird and you get sick and some people actually die from it, then there's a level of liability to the bird veterinary. So that is admittedly one of the reasons we twist your arm to do it, but it's also a good, that's still a good reason to check your bird to have it. And you want to find out that he has it before somebody in your house gets sick. You want to find out if he has it before other birds you might own get sick from him. And if you're a bird boarding facility um, or a bird hospital, we want to find out that he's got it before um, somebody, some, another bird catches it, a staff member in the hospital catches it. So there's lots of different le reasons that that's a very important disease for us. Um, the birds who have the acute form of the disease act sick. They have what we would describe as sick bird signs. They're fluffed up, they get dehydrated, they lose weight, they have diarrhea. Um, it damages their liver, so you see bile pigments in both their feces and their urine. Um, so their urine has that kind of uh, chartreuse yellow, chartreuse green color to it um, if they have the acute disease. Um, and if you don't, if they're, if they're not treated, they get worse. Um, they can have diarrhea, they can vomit um, because their liver's not working right and they can progress to the point where they die. Birds who have the more chronic form of the disease typically have chronic liver damage and their liver gets scar tissue and they develop sclerosis like a person who has some chronic liver damage like alcoholism or uh, chronic active hepatitis or one of the herpes viral uh, hepatitis is oftentimes they end up with sclerosis and then you end up with a liver that's more scar tissue than functional liver and you die of liver failure. So those are typically birds who are in la later in life they're 10 years old, 15 years old, and they're dying of liver failure. Those birds, um, we can cure their chlamydia, we can clear, cure their psittacosis, we can't fix their livers. So we want to find them before they're dying from that stuff as well. Um, people who get the disease, it's worth talking about, get symptoms that are very similar to the flu. Uh, malaysia, which means you just feel crappy, aches and pains, you feel sick. Um, chills, um, you run a fever with it. Oftentimes, people get very high temperatures where they're running temperatures up in 104, 506. Um, um, and the thing about if you have chlamydia is that your symptoms don't go away. So if you have the flu, you're really sick like that for maybe four, five, six days, but then you start getting better. With If you have chlamydia, those symptoms just keep on carrying on. So you continue to have your fever, you continue to have that feeling of malaise. Um, um, people can be damaged by high temperatures and they can have their liver damaged and some people actually do die from chlamydia if it's not caught. Typically if, you're, um, if your physician knows you own parrots, knows you own birds, they're going to catch that and treat you and once treated it's pretty easy to treat. Um, I've personally had chlamydia twice or psittacosis twice. I caught it once from a great horned owl while I was a vet student. Um, I was. I thought I had the flu. It was Christmas time. I was supposed to leave vet school for the weekend, go home for the Christmas holiday, and I happened to meet a pathologist in the ha hallway, a famous pathologist, and he goes, oh, Jeff, um, did you hear about your owl that you sent me? So I'd had an owl that I'd been working on in the raptor rehab center that had, was sick and he died. It was wintertime. It wasn't too surprising. Um, I'd sent him to pathology to, for them to figure out what was wrong with him. And it turns out that he had ornithosis, the non-parrot form of psittacosis. Um, and so when he told me that this bird had died of chlamydia, the light went on in my head and I realized, ah, I didn't have the flu, I had psittacosis. So as soon as I got home for the Christmas holiday, I went to my physician, they did tests on me, put me on medicine, and in literally 48 hours I was a new man. It was nice. Also caught it from parrots in the early 80s that were being imported and coming through the quarantine system. Um, and I have never had it um, since. And I think that probably having had it twice, I'm now immune. I don't think I'm going to catch it again. Um, uh, but um, it, in people, it's easy to treat. It only takes seven to 10 days of medication, depending on what they put you on to cure people with it. Getting rid of it in your bird is much more challenging. Uh, to treat it in your bird, we treat it for 45 days, basically, um, or seven weeks. We, we have to keep the bird on it till the cells that these organisms are hiding in go through their life cycle and, and they die with the chlamydia dies along with those cells. Because otherwise, we have a very hard time getting the drug to where the organism is and clean it out of your bird. So long, 
process, we treat it in two ways, either oral medicine once a day for seven weeks, or an injectable form of the same medicine that comes out of Europe called Vibravenous, it's uh, doxycycline. Um, and they only, the nice thing about that is they only get a single injection a week, uh, pretty much once a week for seven weeks. Um, and a lot of people choose to do that, although it is more expensive, but having to put medicine in your bird every day for seven weeks versus a shot once a week for seven weeks, a lot to you. If you are enjoying our videos, we hope that you can find it in your heart to support our work. It costs between $25,000 to $30,000 a year to care for our flock of heartbroken and abused birds. Most of our birds came with feather destructive disorder. Even a basic exam with blood work costs $300. Medical emergencies cost us thousands a year. We are a nonprofit, and donations are tax deductible to the full extent of the law. We need your support. Birds deserve a happy and healthy life. Become our patron at www.patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary to support us on a per video basis or donate at our webpage today. Um, the second disease we probably ought to talk about is um, probably polyomavirus because it's probably been the most devastating. Polyomavirus was originally um, uh, found in Bajaragars and breed, big breeding um, uh, farms with budgies. Um, and um, a lot of these birds um, did, died as babies and they were called crawlers. Um, the, a lot of these birds didn't feather out right, and, um, uh, but some of them kind of got over it and survived. Um, we found out only later that um, a lot of these, oh, and we called that disease in budgies uh, French molt. Uh, so French molt was uh, primarily para, uh, polyomavirus, although some of these birds had both polyomavirus and beak and feather disease. Um, when that disease got into the other species of parrots, it was much more devastating, and um, especially to babies. So um, adult birds oftentimes didn't die from it and, and would even become long-term carriers, but uh, chicks from those birds or chicks exposed to the disease prior to the time that they weaned um, around the time of weaning had this cataclysmic uh, hemorrhagic disease where their blood vessels would basically just decompose and, and every place you touch them they'd form a bruise and they literally would bleed out and it was just horrid and it would go through the aviaries and um, I mean the nurseries in aviaries or in pet shops and kill every bird in the pet shop or every bird in the aviary. Truly truly frightening disease. You have a bird who come come into the hospital because a lot of these birds would show kind of sick bird signs that stop eating, uh, stop passing stool well, be f hunched up and sleepy and look like they were miserable. And then literally hours later, they would be bleeding from uh, their skin. They'd be bleeding from their eyes and their noses and they'd be dead in, in hours. So, um, so a really horrid, frightening disease. Um, we found the virus, um, in the 90s and they developed a vaccine for it. The vaccine, although I think it's been used um, or misused in other ways, primarily is to protect baby birds. So the idea of the vaccine is to be given to baby birds before they go into an environment where they might be exposed to the virus. So if you're a bird breeder and you've got a nice clean polyoma free aviary, but your birds are gonna go to a pet shop, um, someplace where they might find this mixed population of birds, especially still budgies who still carry polyoma commonly, um, that vaccine will stop them from dying of the disease. But most adult birds don't develop clinical illness with polyoma, so we don't normally treat birds with the vaccine over and over again, like you might vaccinate your dog for rabies, parvovirus, or distemper, or something like that. It's pretty much a baby bird disease, bird virus uh, vaccine. Um, the problem with polyoma, like with beacon feather disease, we'll get to that, is that um, 
although most bird breeders and most collections of birds have been tested, test their expensive birds for the disease, that test probably costs anywhere from high 50s to low $70, dollars, depending on where you get it done and how far they have to mail it and things like that. Um, so um, if you own a cockatoo, it's probably been tested for beak and feather disease, but if you own a budgie or a lovebird or a cockatiel, it's probably never been tested for polyoma and quite likely his parents and his grandparents and his great-grandparents have never been tested for it. So we still have this reservoir of birds who have polyoma and the disease continues to rear its ugly head. So people who are new to breeding oftentimes get that uh, welcome to breeding, your birds are dying of polyoma um, awakening. Um, oftentimes new pet shops have outbreaks of polyoma. Most of those people learn the lesson pretty fast. Because once you've experienced this horrible disease, you're usually much more careful where you buy your birds and who you mix your, especially baby birds with. You'll notice that most uh, uh, bird stores that have baby birds in California, at least you cannot sell a bird that's not weaned now. So the nurseries, if they have birds who are still being hand fed in the pet shop, typically they're isolated. You can look at the birds through a window. But the only people who get to go in there are people who only have exposure to the baby birds. The people who work with the rest of the population in the pet shop don't go in the nursery. Same is true with also most big um, bird breeding places. And when they add new birds, well-run aviaries, if they add birds to their population, they're quarantined and tested before they get into the general population. Um, so um, hopefully a, a disease that certainly is less prevalent than it was, hopefully it'll be gone someday. But uh, what, what that takes is, um, is testing the less expensive birds, the birds where the bird doesn't cost as much as the test is. So personally, if you're going to bring a parakeet into your home and you have other birds, testing for polyoma is a responsible thing to do. Um, what we'd really like to see is the big superstores because they're still the big source for the less expensive birds, cocktails, lovebirds, parakeets, ringneck parakeets, some of those guys. Those organizations should require the, their suppliers to test all their birds, that they have polyoma, beak and feather disease free populations um, because they have the clout to do that. And they can get the suppliers to jump through hoops that the little neighborhood pet shop who sells birds cannot do. And they, they tell, you know, big bird breeder, you know, we're not going to buy your birds if they're not tested for polyoma virus. Those big breeders are going to laugh at them. But if you have an account with Petco or PetSmart or some of these other huge superstores, they can certainly get those organizations to jump through the hoops and, and sell proven disease-free birds. That's really what the bird um, market, the bird community should press upon, get them all tested. Um, next we have beak and feather disease. Beak and feather disease was a similarly devastating bird, uh, bird disease. Um, you'd have birds who came out of the commercial quarantine stations. Commercial quarantine ran between 1975 and 19, well, January 1st, 1990. It's the end of commercial quarantine. Um, but birds would catch that disease or have that disease when they went into quarantine. And the birds who had it had a truly devastating disease. Um, the, in old world birds like cockatoos and African greys, um, it would affect um, the, their feather follicles, their beaks, um, and some other skin tissues. And um, these birds would lose their feathers, they'd be naked, um, um, they would get skin sores, and their beaks literally would rot off. It was pretty nasty to watch. Um, on top of that, um, beak and feather disease um, destroys the, their, um, an animal's B cells. So your immune system has two primary types of lymphocytes that help you deal with, deal with disease. You have T cells that come from this piece of tissue that's in your chest as an embryo um, called your thymus, hence they're T cells. And you have B cells that come from this little pocket in your cloaca. Even we have a cloaca embryologically. The birds have one clear up until the time of about weaning. And that um, this little fold of tissue is called a bursa of fabricus named after an anatomist named Fabricus, and, um, and uh, B cells for bursa. So bursal cells and thymic cells. Uh, T cells are, T, cell, uh, T cells help you with cellular immunity. 
they uh, protect you from fungal diseases and cancer and a number of things like that. And if you have the AIDS virus, you develop the disease of AIDS, what happens is that virus attaches your, attacks your T cells, destroys your T cell immunities. Beacon feather disease um, replicates, that virus replicates in the bursa of young birds and it infects and destroys their B cells. So your B cells are um, this, your lymphocytes that give you humoral immunity, the, the cells that make antibodies that protect you from diseases that where antibody stops them. So if we had a B cell immunity deficiency, you couldn't be protected from measles and chicken pox and uh, TB and um, polio, all those things you get vaccinated for, you'd have no vaccine reaction, would make antibodies against those diseases. So again, it's a disease that starts with baby birds. You have to be exposed to it as babies, we think, to truly get the clinical disease. Um, so keeping it away from birds who are in nurseries and in breeding situations is, is the important thing about stopping it. But along with that is the getting rid of it in the carrier birds, which once again are the parakeets, love birds, cockatiels, um, inexpensive birds where they're, you know, the bird wholesales or at least re retails or wholesales less than the cost of the test oftentimes. Um, um, we developed the test for beak and feather disease, um, also in the 90s, I believe. Um, it's a good test, We're, it's pretty accurate, um, works. We, um, a lot of breeding facilities, I mean boarding facilities also require your bird be tested for beak and feather disease because they're worried about people taking it home and, a, and leading to young birds getting it. Um, some of that is waning because we see so little of it. I think in calendar year 2014 in my hospital, we only saw three cases of beacon feather disease. Um, two cases were in small species. One was in a large species, but it was raised in a pet shop with a lot of lovebirds, cockatiels, and that's probably where it caught it. So we're not seeing nearly as much. Um, most of the same thing is true for those guys. The big pressure is to test everybody. Um, if, you know, you want to make sure you buy your birds if you get them from places um, um, where the birds have been isolated and or um, tested. There is no vaccine for beacon feather disease. Um, there's only a test for it. So prevention is the big, the big aspect there. Next we have um, uh, cloacal papilloma disease, and this is a disease that uh, we've also known about for a long time. It took them a while to find, find the, vax, the virus that causes it because it acted like a virus. Um, they were thinking that it was a papilloma virus. So papilloma viruses cause skin tumors, uh, what you'd call a wart or a papilloma, and this disease is very similar to that. It grows a papilloma-like warty growth in the inside of the vent of the bird, and it um, can be very devastating. It causes uh, bleeding, and it causes scar tissue to develop in there when you treat it, um, and it's recurrent. It'll go away, but then when the bird gets stressed or if um, or things just aren't going well with it, it'll show back up again. Um, and it turns out that um, it's caused by not a papilloma virus, but a herpes virus. So it works like a cold sore gen or uh, genital herpes, where if things aren't going perfect for you, it shows back up. Lives in lives in your ganglia, hides in those little nerve nodes in your body, and when um, when your immune system falters a little bit, it goes back down the nerve and it causes a lesion. In their case, in the bird's case, in their cloaca, um, the problem with it is um, that it's just relatively uncurable. Um, the topical anti-herpes medication like you'd use for your cold sores don't seem to work on it very well. Um, people have removed them surgically with sharp dissection, cutting them out, um, cauterized them, frozen them. That's what we tend to do in our hospital because I think it just causes less um, damage to the tissue because we know it's coming back. Uh, um, all sorts of things, um, not treated them, just try to treat them symptomatically. Um, but the, the inflammation and the damage from this uh, warty growth causes, con causes scar tissue and constriction of vents so that the vent gets smaller, which makes it hard for the bird to pass stool. And we have to do surgery on the vent to try and make it bigger again. 
and their tragic diseases because um, um, there's just no cure for them. So the diagnosis of that disease is uh, made by biopsying the warty growths. Um, there's no question we see less of this disease than we used to, but um, uh, we still do see it. And part of it is I think there's no blood test or, or um, common clinical, like a DNA swab or something that, for this disease. Um, and, and it's not considered real important, so a lot of birds aren't ever tested for it. There aren't, like I know of no boarding facility that requires a bird to be tested for it, um, or um, um, I don't know any breeders who test for it. I think if they have those birds, they try to just get rid of them, and their problems go away, but um, it's a challenging disease for that. So it's a disease that we, um, that we uh, maintain. Um, these birds are expensive to keep because a lot of them will have multiple trips to the veterinarian every year, oftentimes have some surgical procedure or some, you know, that requires the bird to be anesthetized and cauterized or frozen or treated in some fashion. Um, they can get secondary bacterial infections, um, both because the tissue is damaged by the virus and because the birds who can't poop correctly, um, the bacteria grows in their urine and feces in their cloaca and they get secondary bacterial infections from that, just because they can't empty their cloaca. Um, what keeps you from getting, you know, bladder infections and things like that is kind of the flowing screen, stream versus stagnant pond um, philosophy. As long as your bladder fills and empties, or as long as your bird's cloaca fills and empties on a regular basis, just like a running stream, you don't get infections. But if that bacteria sits in there for hours and hours and hours, then the bacteria gets time to grow and can cause secondary infections. We see that in birds who are um, who become nesty or something, they want to sit for hours and hours and they don't get up and make droppings, or birds who refuse to uh, go to the bathroom in their cage, some of those guys will get secondary bacterial infections just from holding their droppings all night long or for long periods of time. So these birds have some of those same problems. So the treatment is to um, try and um, treat the lesions when they're there. Um, some of them we will still put on some anti uh, viral, herpes viral medication. Um, there's, those things are available over the counter. Um, other things to decrease the inflammation like um, NSAIDs, Biloxicam, Medicam help a lot. Both they make the bird more comfortable and they reduce the inflammation caused by the lesion. Um, and, um, and we just try to stay on top of them so they don't get too far behind. A lot of these birds eventually get uh, put to sleep because they're just too expensive and their life, quality of life is not good. Um, and the other strange thing about this disease is some of these birds, especially with uh, chronicity, if they've had the disease for years and years, will show up with other tumor, with actual tumors caused that we think are caused by the virus at least. I don't know how well proven it is. But the common tumors that they get are bile duct adenocarcinomas and pancreatic adenocarcinomas. Those two tumors are very common in these birds and they're about the only time we see those two tumors in parrots is birds who have them. And then rarely they'll get lesions, just like in their cloaca, in their oral cavity. So typically right around the rim of their glottis, those can grow big enough that they can't breathe um, and have to have surgery to be removed and things like that as well. So somewhat tragic disease, uh, disappointing to have a bird that does it. Oh, by the way, those diseases I think um, can occur in all parrots, but they're much more common in New World birds. So Pionis, Amazons, um, macaws, mini macaws. Um, we see it in hawk-headed parrots. My own hawk-headed, one of my own hawk-headed parrots died of pancreatic adenocarcinoma um, after having seven, eight years of cloacal papillomas. If you are enjoying our videos, we hope that you can find it in your heart to support our work. It costs between $25,000 to $30,000 a year to care for our flock of heartbroken and abused birds. Most of our birds came with feather destructive disorder. Even a basic exam with blood work costs $300. Medical emergencies cost us thousands a year. 
We are a non-profit, and donations are tax-deductible to the full extent of the law. We need your support. Birds deserve a happy and healthy life. Become our patron at www.patreon.com slash Chloe Sanctuary to support us on a per video basis or donate at our webpage today. So I'd conclude the uh, infectious disease section here with, with uh, just the idea that um, you need to be aware of your bird's health and, and you need to think about um, both how you keep and treat them and the environment that they're exposed to. So I would tell you that when you add new birds to your home, whether it's your first bird or your 20th bird, um, you want to uh, make sure that bird comes from, or at least have to be aware of the environment that it comes from. It needs to go see a veterinarian and to be tested for at least the most common of those diseases. I just think that that's wise and that's part of the responsibility of owning that bird. It's not that I'm trying to build my practice, it's just irresponsible I think to bring unchecked, untested birds into your environment. Um, and then you just need to have some level of regular monitoring just like you'd go to the doctor periodically. Um, um, at least have a doctor touch that bird, a veterinarian who knows what he's talking about, and preferably a board certified avian veterinarian, but at least the most qualified person you can find. Um, touch that bird on a regular basis every year. We like to do some blood work on birds every five years in my practice. I think every year is probably more than uh, most birds need, but we really like to at least get our hands on them so we can look at them, see what their skin looks like, see what their droppings look like, palpate them for lumps and bumps, look in their vent, look down their throat, make sure they don't have things that, um, that if we caught it early, we could fix. Um, new birds should be quarantined for a period of time, I say 30 days. Things happen pretty quick in birds, I don't think you have to quarantine them forever, uh, but uh, a period of quarantine before they go um, have direct contact with your other birds is wise. You want to take care of the established birds, the birds you've had for a long time first, take care of the new birds last so you don't take things from your new birds to your old birds. Um, and then I'd say, um, you know, put pressure on your uh, um, your bird community. Ask your bird store, do they test birds? Do they uh, limit the birds they buy from birds who are have tested closed flocks? Are they MAP certified? There's a certifying organization um, that, uh, that that uh, gives a rubber stamp to a breeder whose birds are tested and and uh, isolated from new birds coming and going, um, called MAP, um, and those are all good. Put some pressure on those big superstores, you know, to do the right thing with their birds, and um, and that's going to be the end of our infectious diseases. We have such a close community of birds that the potential to get rid of all these diseases is there, and in my lifetime, it would be really neat if we saw a few more of them disappear. So, um, uh, you know, it's nice that we're only seeing maybe a tenth or less of what we saw prior to 1990. It would be even nicer if we saw none of them. So you want to know about me? Yeah, definitely. my background. Um, I grew up in the mountains outside of Salt Lake City. Um, not on a big ranch or something, but a big enough piece of property that we are pretty isolated and in an environment where houses were far apart. Um, but I grew up um, around all sorts of animals. Um, we had dogs and eventually cats in the house, but I got to raise um, animals, baby animals. We chased and caught lizards. We raised the baby birds who fell out of nests. We had a, a raven who adopted us and came back year after year after year every summer to live at our house and eat the dog food. Um, I raised a deer who turned out, a fawn who turned out to be blind um, when he grew up. I, don't know if that's why it got isolated from its parents or if it had something else going on. The fish and game agent who took it away when we discovered it was blind never reported back as to the cause. Um, all sorts of other animals. So um, I had um, my first um, parakeet, parakeets and guinea pigs that were my own when I was five, six, seven. I had rabbits by the time I was seven or eight. Um, I was breeding 
rabbits and guinea pigs by the time I was in my early teens, mostly to support my animal addiction. Um, um, I was lucky in that I knew that I wanted to do this when I was little. When I was in second grade, I, I report, repeat this story all the time, but when I was in second grade and I got to go to the school's library for the very first time, um, I checked out Dr. Doolittle and that was in the early 60s and it was right after the book had come out. As a matter of fact, I remember it was on the new bookshelf. So long before the movie came out, just to age myself, but I took that book home and had my mother read it to me be, as a training manual because I knew I wanted to do this and I thought that that Dr. Doolittle book would be a good way to kind of let me know what I needed to know to be an exotic animal veterinarian. Um, I remember the first time I ever went to see a veterinary hospital, I was very disappointed because it wasn't anything like I thought it should be. My hospital's much more like I would have liked it to be when I saw that. Um, so I went to um, high school and college. Lots of people told me you're not likely to get into vet school, but thank God I was able to. Um, went to the University of Utah, um, got a, my undergraduate degree in um, biology with a strong emphasis in comparative physiology. That's my passion. I love comparative physiology. Um, went to vet school at Colorado State University. Um, and then I was blessed to get to do a kind of a training position with the two big gurus of exotic animal medicine on the West Coast, um, uh, Walt Roscoff and Rick Werpel. Uh, Rick, bless his soul, is dead and gone, died of colon cancer, but uh, Walt still seeing patients in Hawthorne, California. But these guys are responsible for the vast majority of the drug doses we still use today in these animals, and I would say 90% of the blood values for that we use when we test them, uh, as far as you know, CBC and chemistries. It was kind of funny because I think um, the academic community really gave them a hard time and criticized them over um, the stuff that they published on those normals. Um, but I think they've been vindicated because today, 30 years later, um, we still use all their same values, so they were right. They just, uh, same for both the like antibiotic doses and a number of other drug doses, which they had to do kind of more through trial and error because they weren't doing, you know, blood levels and things like that. They were just um, doing what they could, flying by the seat of their pants and finding out what worked and keeping track of it, you know, so. But be because I spent three years with Walt and Rick, I think I'm here where I am today, and I never would have been here had I not had that opportunity. So they're a uh, big part of my uh, my success of being a bird and exotic animal. Uh, moved to San Diego in 1985, opened this hospital in March of 1987. Uh, moved in November of 85, so it's um, took me a little while to get the thing up and running, and it's been going for 28 years as of the first of this month. Um, got to see a lot of things, but um, it's the animals that teach me stuff more than anything. And, uh, and we've been um, wise enough, I'd like to say, to go look. So every animal that dies unexpectedly, um, I'm twisting somebody's arm to let me do the post-mortem on it to find out what it had, why it died, what was going on. And I don't resent doing any of those necropsies over 30 years. I've done lots and lots and lots of necropsies. Um, I was lucky enough to get included in the political aspect of bird medicine and reptile medicine and small mammal medicine um, and get to be part of um, that community and help direct um, the direction that some of that medicine went for years and years. I've been kind of out of the political end since the late 90s. Um, now my kids are grown up, I may get back in, so they better watch out. Uh, because, um, I don't know, the other thing about uh, being in this business is you get to develop an opinion. And I certainly have mine. <laughs> so, uh, the caveat with everything is that, you know, this is my opinion. Some of, it, some of it's proven, some of it's challenging, if not impossible to prove. At least where we are today. So, thankfully, um, I'm still here. Hopefully I'll be here for a lot of years to go. I like going to work every day. Part of it's liking people, you know, because um, if you, I, I meet people all the time who go, I want to be a veterinarian because I don't really like people that well. But my business is really a people business because everything we do is negotiation. 
that we have to work out because it's not like human medicine where we just get to do everything we want with your patient. Somebody has to pay for it, I'm afraid, and so everything we do, pretty much we sit down and try to figure out how to make it work. How do we do enough to save your animal um, at a price that you can afford? You know, So it's unfortunate or fortunate, I don't know which, but it's the way veterinary medicine is. We welcome your feedback on our videos. We look forward to your insights, tips, questions, stories, and pictures. You can email us at cockatude at chloesanctuary.org, reach us on Twitter at sign Chloe Sanctuary, and join with us on our Facebook Chloe Sanctuary page. Please visit our website at www.chloesanctuary.org. That's Chloe spelled C-H-L-O-E. You can support us on a per-episode basis by visiting www.patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, forward slash Chloe Sanctuary.